Hello, this is Dr. Beverly Wright, and thank you for listening to Tag Data Talk, sponsored by Birchworks and hosted by Dr. Beverly Wright. Birchworks is the national leader in total talent solutions with a specialization in data positions, including data and cloud engineering, business intelligence, data science, machine learning, AI, among other roles and career paths. As industry pioneers, Birchworks prides themselves on their approach as trusted advisors and career advocates by providing subject matter expertise, compelling career opportunities, and leading information and research on trends in the industry. Birchworks also leverages their proprietary first-party data and career coaching expertise to offer a range of resources that directly address the gender pay gap. These resources are specifically curated to allow for increased salary transparency, including salary and market trend data, career development advice, and the annual Birchworks salary reports that contain extensive compensation data, hiring, and market research. Birchworks, building a world that works better for everyone. Hello, I'm Dr. Beverly Wright, and welcome to Tag Data Talk. With us today, we have the amazing Tom Davenport, who is a distinguished professor at Babson College, among with many other accomplishments. Welcome to Tag Data Talk, Tom Davenport. Thanks, Dr. Bev. I guess you have to call me Dr. Tom if you're going to be Dr. Bev, but whatever. That's right. <laughs> no, you yeah, know, I, I don't. Doctor, doctor. I'm, <laughs> I'm not a real doctor, I don't think. So I have a PhD, but I don't really use that terminology. So. Yep, I got you. I've heard that um, PhDs are no longer supposed to use that term. We're supposed to be called uh, comma PhD now, <laughs> not use the term doctor, which I thought was interesting. Well, let's start off with a little background. Uh, tell us, Tom, why are you so cool? Uh, I'm not sure that I am so cool, but um, uh, if I were cool, it would be because I started um, writing and talking about analytics pretty much before anybody else at least used that term back in the early 2000s and written, I don't know, now I think four books on analytics and five books on AI. So um, in terms of generating enough content to put anybody to sleep. Um, that's that's my coolest attribute. So. <laughs> well, I think your content is waking people up on, in the contract. <laughs> so you wrote three books this past year, didn't you? I did, all on AI. One on, one we're going to talk about on working with AI, one called All In on AI, which is about companies that embrace it really aggressively. Um, and one on healthcare AI, advanced introduction to AI and healthcare. Oh, nice. Great, well our topic today is all about AI. So we're talking about working with AI and the human machine collaboration, like one of your books. And I'm super excited to dive into this, but let's first start with a little bit of a definition. We talk about working with AI and the human machine collaboration So what do we mean by AI in this context? And then let's talk through the human-machine collaboration. Sure. Well, you know, different people have different definitions. I tend to take a pretty broad cut at it. And, and, you know, any sort of um, technology that does what humans could only previously do. And so that means I include not only machine learning, which a lot of people are really focused on these days, but also the more traditional types of um, AI, like, you know, expert systems or rule-based systems, which are still around in a lot more companies than people imagine, and even robotic process automation, which works in part by rules, not the smartest AI system, but um, it does things that humans could only do previously, so um, I include it. So I'm, uh, you know, pretty broad umbrella. Yeah. Okay. So you've got the, you've got RPA, you've got pretty much, um, it sounds like a broader view other than just making data science models and making the data science process more efficient. You're looking at the broader view of things that machines can do to help with efficiencies and uh, reduction of human processing. But that sort of yeah, kind of summarize no, that's, it? that's fair to say. I think data science tends to be very heavily focused on machine learning. And I, as I say, I'm, I'm broader than that. And I think all the technologies are increasingly combined. I mean, one of the conclusions from my 
book is that in practice, you often find a co combination of different AI technologies in one use case. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure. Um, and you were right <laughs> that the companies that are just using heuristics and rules-based and kind of simple processing, there's still quite a few of those. So that's really uh, uh, interesting to see the diversity that you have among different players in the field. So let's talk about human-machine collaboration, which may be a term a little bit less known. So can you tell us what your definition of, of that means? Sure. So typically, you know, the impact of AI um, on humans falls into two different categories. And one um, historically discussed a lot is automation, where we kind of eliminate humans from the, from the kind of day-to-day -day execution of, of work. And the other is augmentation, which is one that I've always been more partial to, in part because I am a human. I think it's better for humans. And um, I think it's way more common in the world at large. Not that much um, large-scale automation, anyway, has taken place despite a number of predictions that it would. And so it's, you know, smart humans, smart machines working alongside each other, sometimes the Machine does 80% of the work and the machine and the human 20% and sometimes vice versa. And there are a lot of different patterns of that collaboration, but, you know, working together to accomplish some objective. Got it. Okay. And typically that's um, automation or augmentation, but probably one or the other, not both. Like you wouldn't typically have a system that is sometimes automation and other times augmentation, those are usually um, orthogonal? Well, you know, I think they often are orthogonal, but I hope that they are not um, on a permanent basis because we really need both. I mean, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. automation is very good for efficiency and productivity and, and you know, um, large scale outputs of the same thing. And augmentation is more good for adaptability and innovation and flexibility. So um, clearly, we need both of those things in many um, work environments. And so um, they shouldn't be orthogonal, but they often are. You're right. Yeah, gotcha. OK, well, this sounds like a lot of benefits, right? I mean, you've got more efficient processing. You've got uh, production at large scale. You've got innovation and flexibility. Why in the world are not more companies and people in general embracing human machine uh, collaboration? Why, why is there a resistance of some sort? Like do people get scared? Are there certain barriers or challenges? Help us walk through it. Well, I, I, you know, one, I think it is much more common than we realize. Um, my co-author um, for this book, a guy named Steve Miller, a professor in Singapore, Singapore Management University. And I found easily 30 case studies. Our editor didn't like one of them so much, so we ended up with 29 in the book. Um, and it wasn't that hard to find them. But um, we did encounter, um, I think, challenges that organizations have. I mean, our goal in the beginning was to only um, talk to frontline workers who were working with AI but in almost every case, they would say, well, yeah, I'll talk to you, but you know, you might want to talk to my supervisor who helped design the job, um, and you might want to talk to the you know, COO or the CEO who really you know, had the idea in the first place, and you might want to talk to the head of um, analytics and AI who made it happen, and you might want to talk to the vendor. So we ended up doing way more, <laughs> way more interviews than we um, thought or hoped, although it was um, quite interesting. So we, we say, you know, it takes a village to make these things happen and a fair amount of time and money generally, um, you know, to do all the things necessary to make it happen. It's sort of, um, I think your next guest is going to talk about creating a data product and that takes a lot, you know, it's not just modeling, it takes a lot of change in the organization as well. Yeah, for sure. Is it possible that companies are um, embracing the human machine collaboration and not really realizing it? I know one time, this is a long time ago, um, I taught, by, well, I've always taught 
by experiential learning. Before I knew it was called experiential <laughs> learning, I had come, I had my students work with real companies on real data sets to solve real problems. And then I learned about that term and I thought, well, what is this? And as I got into it, I was realizing that I'm already doing the experiential learning. Is it possible we are doing some human machine collaborations? Yeah, I think, you know, there's a, a fair amount of it. And, you know, now to take the um, currently most fashionable form of AI, um, these generative AI systems that can create content of various types, text and and images and video now and so on, um, that, that's all collaborative. Um, you have to give these systems a prompt in the first place to come up with something. And if you're at all smart about it, you're going to look at what comes out and edit it a bit because it's probably not going to be perfect at all. And um, so, you know, you might want to, uh, um, and, you, and you might iterate on it several times. So I think that's a very collaborative process. And um, as I say, in almost every case that we found of AI usage in companies, there was this sort of human in the loop um, environment doing um, some of the work or, you know, there are various patterns of that collaboration. You know, maybe the machine takes the first cut, um, as we found in a medical coding example, and then the human experience, human medical coder reviews it and makes sure that it's reasonable and so on. Or sometimes it's vice versa. Um, radiology, they often tell radiologists, you, you are the first set of eyes and the a deep learning system is the second set of eyes. So um, a lot of different patterns. And sometimes it's, as I said, it's um, mostly the machine, as in, um, say, credit card um, issuance. Um, if you're lucky if you'd ever talk to a human in a, in a task like that. Um, or the opposite is sort of um, robotic surgery, where the surgeon is making all the important decisions and is really the brains behind the operation and the machine is just kind of helping the surgeon cut a little more straightly into your body or um, do, you know, nice little sutures and so on. So um, all sorts of patterns there, but it's all collaborative in one way or another. Hmm. Yeah, I definitely want some straight cuts. If they're going to have to use <laughs> cuts, I prefer them to be really precise. Huh. And uh, I don't mind having a machine help with that process. So very good examples. Um, in your book, I know you had 30 and you had to drop one example and you love them all the same. But yeah, that's can you right. give us one of, your, one of your top examples so that our listeners can better understand this uh, human machine collaboration? What would you say is your favorite? Um, well, generally my favorite is one at, um, Morgan Stanley, the wealth management company, where they developed a machine learning application to um, make recommendations to customers uh, about what investments to pursue. Um, but it's highly collaborative because they give the financial advisor the decision, do I send out that recommendation? Um, you know, how do I want to couch it for that customer? Um, I, the customer cares as much about the communication from the advisor and knowing the advisor is thinking about them as I think the quality of the idea itself. So it's it's very much a collaboration between the financial advisor and the system. Um, and the people, they've been very um, voluntary about whether the advisors have to use it or not, but the ones that do are much more successful. They have more, you know, assets under management and, and all that sort of thing. And it's, um, I think, is one of the most effective sort of robo-advice systems out there because it really gives, you know, specific stock and bond and um, mutual fund and ETF kind of recommendations. And most of them are not quite that specific. Um, another favorite one of mine, which I might not mention in general, but um, because your next guest is from 84.51 in Cincinnati, the Kroger sort of um, data science subsidiary, I did one there about automated machine learning. And, you know, the 
Um, they were one of the earlier organizations to embrace automated machine learning, and they use it quite effectively, I think, both for professional data scientists and for, um, uh, I think, what they're called insight specialists, people who are not formally trained in data science, but who kind of understand numbers broadly and um, can do some great work, too. So I talked about, you know, who does who does um, what with auto, auto ML and how they train the people and what things um, it helps them accomplish and, and so on. So that's another example of, you know, working working with AI. Yeah, those are both fantastic examples. So what do you think are, are, are holding people back? Like if you go into a company and they're using very simple, you know, maybe they're still stuck in BI world and they're using heuristics possibly for some of their decision making or they're relying on the golden gut mostly. <laughs> is it is it lack of talent? Is it the technology constraints? Do you think some of it is cultural or process oriented? <laughs> How would you um, get a company over the hump? Yeah, I, you know, I think there are a number of factors. One is that they... Most companies are still just experimenting with AI and doing proofs of concept and so on. So, um, again, you know, you're I'm doing a great job of setting up your next guest here. But um, uh, at places like 84.51, they're viewing it as a, you know, broad uh, product development process involving uh, organizational change as well as, you know, just the modeling and data data collection and, and training and so on. Um, so that's one factor. People aren't viewing it in quite, quite the right way. I, you know, I think part of it is just a lack of awareness of all the things that AI can do on the part of senior managers. So, you know, we really ought to um, have uh, ambitious training programs for them. I was just working earlier this week with a bunch of uh, military people at, in ex an executive program at MIT and they've decided a large number of senior military leaders need to be trained in what AI can do and what its strengths and weaknesses are and so on. And we don't have that in many companies yet. Um, you know, it's it's hard to find the talent, of course, not, not new news to anybody listening to your podcast. It's hard to find good um, analytics and data science talent, certainly. Um, um, so I think there are a variety of factors, but I think we're definitely moving in that direction. I think you mentioned earlier that people are concerned about what it's going to do to their jobs. In general, I find that, you know, once they understand what AI does, they realize, well, hey, one, I do a lot more things than the one task that the AI supports. And two, that everybody in our 29 examples thought, you know, their job was not going to go away. Now, they're and maybe you've seen some of these surveys that they ask people, is AI going to take your job away? And they all say, no. But is AI going to take your coworkers' jobs away? Yeah, those those guys are history. <laughs> so um, people may be just sort of whistling past the graveyard, but uh, I don't think that's true. Yeah, no, that's, <laughs> that's interesting. Um, so it sounds like some of the potential solutions are really just advocacy, education, training, and understanding the use cases. Like, here's how much it can benefit you, right? Yeah, and that and view and understanding that there's going to be a fair amount of organizational change involved in sure. this process and being prepared for that whole sort of pipeline of activities from, you know, ideation all the way through to deployment and then ongoing maintenance and, and governance. Right, right. And some of it is just change is hard and it's going to it's going to have a ripple effect in many areas of the company. So what do you think in our in our last question before I ask for your final advice? Um, what do you think the future holds? Is this is this how it is now? It's just always going to be like this or is it going to be more so like this? Are we looking at um, almost a complete automation and the humans are very, you know, minor as far as their involvement or help us understand what that paradigm looks like. Well, I think, um, you know, for the, I'm older than you, but I think maybe for the time that both of us are in the, in the workforce, we don't have much to worry about um, from, you know, AI becoming so capable that it does everything better than we do. So the singularity is not coming anytime soon. And short of the singularity, I think, yes, this is the way it's going to be. Um, almost every 
knowledge work job anyway, um, and many manufacturing jobs and so on are going to involve working with AI. And I think the only people who really have to fear it are the people who just don't want to work with AI. You know, I wrote a little piece a few years ago with a leading radiologist and in um, the Boston area who also has a PhD in AI. And, and we wrote, he, it was his idea, that the only radiologists who are going to lose their jobs to AI are those who refuse to work with AI. And I think you could say the same thing about accountants and marketers and maybe even professors. Who knows? We may be the last to go. But there are things that AI can do to to make us more effective as well. Yeah, gotcha. That's a very good prediction. And what final piece of advice would you give for people, Tom, aside from reading your awesome book about the 29 case studies, which I uh, definitely recommend, but what final piece of advice would you give to listeners who are interested in better understanding the human machine collaboration? Um, well, you know, view it from the beginning as something that is a human machine collaboration, uh, emphasize augmentation more than um, automation. And um, really, I think ultimately organizations are going to need to put somebody in charge of that that collaboration. You know, we have HR people who are concerned with the human workforce and we have IT people who are concerned with the, you know, AI digital workforce but we don't have anybody looking at the intersection of the two in most cases. And so I think we're going to have to have new organizational roles that say, how do we design these jobs? How do we let people participate in the design of their work? How do we do a good job of helping AI make us all more effective and efficient? Awesome. And and that the way you stated that was how do we leverage the AI, not the other way around, <laughs> that we're still the ones that are uh, managing it and in control, so to speak. For the time being, we're still in charge. <laughs> yes, that's a good thing. Very good. Thank you so much to Tom Davenport from Babson College for talking to us about human-machine collaborations. Thanks for listening to Tag Data Talk, sponsored by Emory Continuing Education. I'm Dr. Beverly Wright. Have a great data set.